All right, Henry, I just hit the record button. Is there a, a little red flashing light for you? There is, yes. Awesome. Good to, good to see. All right, so um, nice to meet you. Nice to talk with you. Thanks yeah. for uh, joining me today for this little conversation. <laughs> um, tell, me a little, tell me your name, your background, and a little bit about yourself, just so uh, anybody who watches this, who's watching this, uh, can get to know you a little bit. Of course, so my name is Faison Sayed. I'm the executive director of the Missouri chapter of the Council on American Islamic Relations, or CARE Missouri. And we are a chapter of the largest civil rights and advocacy organization for Muslims in America. At CARE, we believe that everybody should be treated fairly, regardless of their race, religion, ethnicity, or background, whatever it is. And that in order for us to achieve and live in a country where everybody is treated equally and fairly, we believe that we do need to defend the civil rights of not only American Muslims, but of all people. Of course, the nature of the work we do, the majority of our clients are Muslim. So we engage a lot in like legal work, and we also do a lot of advocacy within government. We regularly appear on media outlets, and we speak, and we give a voice to the American Muslim community in the media. And we do a lot of outreach and educational work within our community. Awesome. Um, we, uh, we have a mutual friend, uh, Omar, and yes. uh, he, uh, I'm really glad that we had the opportunity to chat today and just to get to know each other a little bit and hear some of the challenges that, um, Islam or that Muslims face in America. Um, but also what can we do together, uh, to work together to, uh, to, to help heal some of the tension that exists in America and, um, across the world. And so. I guess some of the, I, I just wanted to, to chat with you, to talk with you, to hear some of your stories, some of the things that are going on in, in the uh, Muslim community. Um, and then also to hear from you, what are some of the things that we can do um, to kind of build bridges across divides? What should we do if we run into situations that we don't know what to do? Um, if we see bigotry, you know, how, how do we handle that? Um, but then also, you know, what are, what are some simple ways that we can, we can work together across communities. So I told you about the project that I'm working on. Um, it's really just, uh, I've noticed a, a real lack of um, conversations. It's, it's just really, right now, it's really hard to have a good conversation with somebody. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like it, there's, there's tension, there's division. And what I like about CARE and what you guys are doing is that it's all about building bridges and that it's about reaching mm -hmm. across and helping understand, helping educate, have honest conversations. And that's exactly what I want to have more of. And that's what I want to kind of see if there's anything that we can do to help Americans have more honest, educational and compelling conversations about important issues and important things that matter. Um, so tell me. How how did you get involved with care? What's your uh, what's your background? Give me set the stage a little bit for us. Yeah, well, um, before I get into that, let me kind of give you a little background of sort of how we view um, our place now in America. America is an amazing country. It's a, it's a country in which we have values that you know all people are created equal. That we are a nation of immigrants and a nation of refugees. That people can come here and make a new life for themselves and become American. But even though America had these ideals, as a country, we've always struggled to achieve those ideals. When we say America is a country of immigrants, that means something very different for African Americans who were brought here, many of them against their will. And when we say America is welcoming of other people throughout her history, we've seen other people being discriminated. We've lived in a country where Japanese Americans, for example, who lived here for over five generations, were then rounded up from their home, from their business and put internment camps. We've witnessed in places like New York City, when the Irish came here after the famine happened, that there were signs around the country that said Irish need not apply. Just recently in the 60s, when John F. Kennedy was running for office, even though about a third of all Americans at the time were Catholic, we saw anti-Catholic propaganda and hysteria taking over the nation and saying that the Catholic man is running for office and that the Pope is going to take over and they're going to impose their laws on American constitutions. So even though America has these values, she's always struggled to achieve those values. But every generation of people that come and they fight to be accepted, they fight to be uh, for their rights, they create a nation that's better for all people. And today, the country that we live in, one of the forefront population that's being um, targeted are the American Muslim community. 
And what's amazing is that I'm proud to work for an organization like CARE because we're on the front lines of combating bigotry and anti-Muslim hysteria, which is used by many of these groups not to really target Muslims alone, but to use as a fear tactic in order for them to gain political power, in order for them to gain prowess, in order for them to not discuss America's real problem with education, with um, transportation, with all these other issues that are really impacting our country, and say, you know, the real problem are these undocumented immigrants, or the real problem are Muslims. And that type of scapegoating is a strategy that's been used throughout all time. So that's where we are today. A little bit about myself, I, you know, I, I was born in Lahore, Pakistan. I grew up uh, in Kirkwood, Missouri, in St. Louis, Missouri. And, and uh, I went to school here. I went to college at Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa. Great university, lots of corn, lots of uh, beef uh, all around. And what's interesting is when I went to Drake, I was studying astronomy, physics, and mathematics. But I switched my major to policy and history because in 2008, um, Iowa has what's called the first caucus, right? So I was a state in the middle of, middle of America, but they've got the first caucus, which means that all these people who are running for office, they'll actually go and visit Drake University, like Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, Ted Cruz, John McCain, all these people would come to my university in this small town, and I was like, what's going on? So it's at that time I realized that I wanted to switch my major from astronomy, physics, and math to politics, and uh, that's where I graduated in. And when I came back to St. Louis, you know, shockingly, there weren't a lot of jobs for people who study politics. I know that's kind of uh, shocking for a lot of people. And then I heard about this group called CARE. And I wanted to go and volunteer with them. I wanted to become an intern, right, you know, unpaid. And uh, it's funny because when I applied, they're like, well, hey, listen, we're looking for a full-time executive director. Would you like the job? And I was just graduated from college maybe a year ago. And I was like, well, I have zero experience in nonprofit work. I have zero experience in civil rights work, but I'll take it, right? Uh, and since then, I've been doing it uh, since then. It's kind of a, a tri trial by fire. Just jump yeah, up. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> no kidding, no kidding. So just to, I want to recap some of the things that I heard you talk about. Um, that America is a nation built, on, built by immigrants. It's a nation of immigrants. But it means something different to, to different communities. You know, whether mm. it's the Irish or whether it's the Japanese or whether it's uh, the Muslim community or the Mexican community or... Everybody has their own unique stories, and we all have come here for a reason. Um, that That's right. said, America struggles in a lot of ways to really uphold or live out the value system that we strive, that we're all striving for. And so we have this challenge mm -hmm. and this tension between um, communities who come here for a promise and then politicians who kind of seem to scapegoat and marginalize some communities in order to gain power or to place blame or to rally people behind um, fear or hatred in order to achieve power. And that's a common theme that we've kind of seen throughout um, the, the country and then, um, mm. or our history. And then also you were talking about how uh, your experience, your personal experience uh, with coming here and studying astronomy and then um, getting involved and seeing that, hey, there's, a, there's an opportunity that there's a world of politics out here and maybe I can use some of my skills and my resources to do something better. And then you just kind of showed up and you ended up being the executive, becoming the executive director because you showed up and you said, hey, um, I care about this. I've studied about this and I want to do something about it. That's right. That's right. I think that's awesome. Good times. That's a good summary. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so talk to me about some of the challenges that that uh, the Muslim community faces right now. Some of the things that are going on um, that you are able to talk about that you want to talk about. What would you like to to help us focus on? Well, let me put your uh, viewers in um, a, a sort of historical perspective. Okay. So, of course, when I was growing up, we very rarely talked about Islam or Muslims. We very rarely heard about Islam or Muslims on TV. It wasn't really that common. And then after September the 11th, of course, that's when our community was brought to the forefront because of the uh, tragic attacks that happened on this country. What's interesting, though, is that one year after, uh, that after the attacks happened, obviously there was a, a, a spike in anti-Muslim hate crimes across the country, right? Which is uh, tragic and a sad, but also it's understandable because many people equated Islam and Muslims with the terrorists, right? And what was interesting though, is that one year after the September 11th attacks, the level of anti-Muslim hate crime in this country went back to pre 9-11 uh, rates. I mean that within one year we were back to 
you know, before September 11th happened. And that's for a lot of reasons. At the time, uh, George Bush, who again had many flaws and I have a lot of criticism for him, one of the things he did right is that he clearly said that this isn't about Muslims or Islam, it's about quote unquote terrorism, right? Um, and what's interesting is that that's how it kind of remained until about 2007. In 2007, especially in 2008, that's when we saw a dramatic increase in anti-Muslim hate crimes. And now today, the anti-Muslim hate crimes are at three times the levels as they were after September the 11th, which goes against logic and reasoning. Because you'd imagine that after the major incident that happened, you would think that things would get gradually you know, calmer and calmer and calmer. But actually, we see the spike increase. And what's happened is that in 2007, 2008, multiple things happened all at once. First, the first African-American ran for president, uh, Barack Hussein Obama, and that's when the birther movement started. The one of the ways that our current president, uh, Donald Trump, and others try to delegitimize him is that they said that he's not American. In fact, he's actually Muslim. And that's when you started hearing this type of rhetoric happen. We also saw the Democrats resoundingly defeat the Republicans in all three branches of government, or all two branches of government, the House, Senate, and uh, the executive. And third, within a few months after Obama was elected, we saw the Great Recession hit. And we saw millions of people lose their home, property values diminish. So what happened is at that time, there was a concentrated effort by different groups of people in order to equate Obama as a Muslim, in order to uh, basically say that this recession, everything that happened was a result of uh, this, you know, him being elected and this crisis was started like that. And that's when we saw an extreme movement really begin within the Republican Party specifically. That's when we saw the rise of the Tea Party, especially after Citizens United, which allowed for unlimited campaign contributions, so mean that billionaires could actually fund individuals all across the country. And we saw the Republican Party shift far to the right, and they're still in that area today. And with that, we also saw their party for the first time since September 11th happened, their party as a whole collectively started embracing Islamophobia as a political tactic. So it's only after Obama got elected, and only after 2008, that we then saw the Republican Party mainstreaming, particularly Islamophobia, and using it as a mainstream rhetoric. So we remember, you might have remembered hearing like Ted Cruz saying that we had to start patrolling Muslim neighborhoods. Um, other people running for the Republican presidency saying that they wouldn't trust Muslims to be on the Supreme Court or on their cabinet unless they took a loyalty test. And it's that type of rhetoric that really laid the foundation for now the increase uh, in Islamophobia that we see across the country today. And I think as we speak about Islamophobia and these challenges, we have to remember that people always don't, you know, always mistrust the other, always don't like the other. But it's not until people who are running for office, elected officials and politicians, use the economic fear at the country in 2008 and afterwards, and link it with xenophobia, Islamophobia, and other fears, that they're able to then run on whole campaigns like that. And the most recent campaign with not only Donald Trump, but with others, you saw that happening. You know, if you would ask an average Trump supporter, why do you support Trump, or what do you know about him? Some of the things they would say, you know, if you ask them what's his economic agenda or his um, agenda for infrastructure or agenda for education or his agenda for these other things, they really don't know. But everybody knows build the wall, you know, the Muslim ban and these things. So these have now become mainstream rallying cries, and those cries have now really divide the whole country. So one of the main challenges that our community is facing is when we are, we're trying to really not only educate the population, fight for civil rights, but really trying to end this reliance by politicians and Islamophobia. And once we're able to do that, I think we'll see the rates of anti-Muslim hate crimes in this country diminish. It's so strange to me, and I think you nailed it right on the head. We, I, I don't know, I, I voted the first time I voted in 2008 for President Obama, and I thought that we as a mm -hmm. country were going to move in a different direction. And to start mm -hmm. hearing these uh, rallying cries and this like animosity, the birther movement, uh, he's from Kenya, he's a Muslim, these like these lies that just kind of caught right. people held on to. It was, it was, it blindsided me. I had no idea that, that I thought we were moving one direction. We clearly are not heading that direction at all, or at least part of the country is not heading that direction. And then to see it, it, some of these, um, these ideas and these, you know, to have a test, or to have a, uh, you know, the patrolling of Muslim neighborhoods. Like, that to me is such an anti-American idea. 
But then to see so many Americans holding on to this or to think that this somehow is a good idea, it, it makes my head so confused. Like, how did we get here? This is not, this is not an American value in my mind. Um, and so yeah, it's a uh, very, very insightful analysis and historical perspective as to kind of how we started taking the steps to get where we are today. Um, I had a, a conversation with a, a friend of mine from high school. I hadn't talked with him in years and years and years, and he pops up on Facebook. And um, I had made a comment on it was an it was a, a comment about immigrants um, being welcomed here. And uh, some of the things that came out of his mouth just were were mind blowing to me. And the, what he was typing, and the thoughts and the, the beliefs that he has about Islam and Muslims and the core values. Um, that he believes that Muslims hold and share just like wh Where did you where are you getting this information from? It's not in my experience. It's not anything that um, You know, we we learned about or we've talked about or that we've experienced it's What's going on here? But it just his mind and his head was filled with these half-truths and these these twists and these lies and these things that that uh, have allowed him to continue down this road and come to some really bad thinking He's got really bad thinking and some bad conclusions that he's arrived at. Um, I want to ask you, because that's one of the challenges that I face, is when we're having a conversation with somebody, um, you know, we can have these facts and we can present these facts, but also I think there's an element of telling a story and telling somebody's personal experience um, with Muslims. Like I, I lived with uh, uh, my roommate in college. It was from Saudi Arabia. And so I have a, a year's worth of experience that colors my perception of the world. And um, to me, that was, that's, that's a story that I can share with other people and I can talk about it. But it, it seems like when I try to talk about facts, about how, you know, I rattle off facts against something uh, or towards somebody um, and I, I tell them these facts, it doesn't necessarily change their mind, but when I tell them a story, sometimes that seems to be more effective. Have you, do you have any experience with that or what are your thoughts? So I'm a big fan of reaching out. Part of our religious tradition, it says that repel animosity or hatred with something that's better and you'll find the one that has that hatred towards you will become like a close friend. So a few things that we've done particularly with CARE is that when, uh, Donald Trump, the candidate, came to St. Louis. He held a big rally in downtown St. Louis. And many of the progressive movements and the liberal, uh, my friends in that movement, they actually came to protest. And, I, and then that's what I was planning to do. But then I spoke to one of my sheikhs and he said, you know, if you protest, that's exactly what they're expecting you to do, right? So the narrative that the other side has is that they're being shut down. They're being uh, protested. Nobody wants to hear them talking to too much political correctness. So instead, what I did is I got a group of about a dozen Muslims, and we went and actually passed out donuts to everybody in that line. And we passed out over 1,000 donuts and met over 2,000 people. And at that time, that went viral. So there's like a news articles about it, and it went really, really viral because it just shook everybody by surprise. I remember when I first got there, believe it or not, when I got to that rally, there was uh, Antifa, all black. One of the guys had, I don't know, maybe this was pre-planned by who knows what, but right when I got there, a man got the American flag, stepped on it, and then the Trump supporters were going crazy, and there was about a fight, and the police came in, and then myself and my other group was like, oh, okay. And then we just literally went to that scene with Dunkin' Donuts, and we just opened up the glass and said, who wants donuts? Everybody, we're here to give away free donuts. We're not here to fight anybody. We're not here to do anybody. And everybody, you could just turn their faces like, what the heck? Like, it took them totally by surprise and shock. And I think one of the realities that we as a, as a nation – have to realize is that people are good all around the world and that they're taught to hate one another for the, for very specific agendas and typically those agendas relate um are typically done by people who are wealthier people who are in power people who are in position of influence because if the population are fighting each other then they're not realizing that as a country our wages have stagnated for the last 30 years they're not realizing that all of us are just a few you know, payments, if we don't get a few payments, then we're going to be homeless on the street. We don't realize that we're paying a raised amount for daycare. If we get sick, we're going to be, all of our life savings are going to be in the trash, right? So all of us, we have, most people have that in common, but that's not really a positive rallying cry. So rather what happens is that you create situations where people get into groups 
and they get into tribes and there's that tribal and they fight each other even though in reality they probably have much more common with one another than they have with uh, the person in office or whatever, anything like that, right? So part of what I try to do is I try to put myself in those difficult situations, circumstances, to make myself available, show up in those areas in order to really meet people who have those different opinions than I do. And until you do that, you're not going to be effective. One other example I'll give is, um, I forget the name of the school, but there's a recent school shooting and a lot of those teenagers basically went and started a movement across the country uh, in Florida or maybe in Texas, I forget exactly where it was. But remember those students, they actually went and there's a counter protester. There are people with guns onto the teeth, basically saying that they have the right to hold guns. Now these kids actually went and spoke to those people and recorded. And when they talk to one another, the people with the gun are like, well, actually we believe that too. Like they believe in sensible gun reform. They believe that, yeah, you know, people who are mentally disturbed should not be owning weapons. And it, if they didn't meet each other, the two groups would have left like those guys are crazy and those guys are crazy. So I think part of what we as a country need to do is realize that we are in silos, like the news you watch, the social media feeds that you have that actually reinforces your worldview. And you, if you want to reach out across the aisle, you actually have to reach out across the aisle. But also while remembering that there might be more than one argument for an issue, but there's often not two moral sides to an issue. So as you reach out to the aisle, you want to realize that, they, yes, they're, they're human, they have their humanity, you want to hear what they have to say, but also remember that morally, you know, you have a point that you want to get across, and you have to be strong and able to uh, stand for that. It's really important, um, because, I, you know, I, I talk about with, with people and, and their concern that when you reach across the aisle and you start a conversation with somebody, they don't want to find common ground. They don't want to find, it's, I mean, you, it's, it's easier for me to believe that this person is irrational, they're crazy, they just have really bad beliefs and they're just not a good person. And until we find that common ground, it's really, you can't have a conversation. But mm -hmm. when we find that common ground, we say, you know what, there, there are shared beliefs here. There are some things that we really can agree on. Like you were talking about with the gun act, the, the, the activists versus the second amendment, you know, like when they start chatting, we all want the same things. There, there's, mm -hmm. there's so much that we can agree on. We want safety. We want security. We want prosperous country. We don't want people who are innocent to be killed. Nobody wants that. But, but when we get in our silos, it's so easy to just demonize the other side and to not look at it from another perspective. And I, I remind people that when we find common ground with someone else, it doesn't mean that we're giving up our moral morality or our moral view simply because we found common ground with somebody who holds some different beliefs than us. It just means that, hey, like maybe I, I helped them think about morality in a different way, or maybe I helped them think about things in a different way. And I didn't have to give up anything about my beliefs or what I think is really right. And I, I wonder if some people are concerned that just having that and reaching across the aisle means that their beliefs are not as strong or that there's some like there's some something that says you know in the activist handbook that you have to be angry and you can't um you can't agree with somebody who you know might have a a really bizarre view but in reality until we we find that common ground we, there's really no hope for progress there's no hope for for uh, conversation yeah. for dialogue and with all of that, we also have to realize where America is right now. By 2050, there are no, there's not going to be a majority in the country, right? There's going to be large groups of minorities. And like the Hispanic population is going to probably be one of the largest population in the country. So we are living in a time where this transition is happening. And we're having multiple transitions at once. Ethnically, the country is changing, and that's creating a lot of stress for a lot of people. Uh, white supremacy is being challenged all across the nation, and people who benefit from white supremacy they're, you know, without even knowing it, they, they find an issue with that. So now we're seeing the rise of, well, white people are being oppressed, not just, you know, they're, they're, they're joining that group. We also see uh, economically, we see more and more money being given to a smaller, smaller group of people. That's creating economic stresses on the whole population. And we see a population that's now also living longer as well. And as people live longer, they want to live back to, quote unquote, the good old days, right? And Donald Trump said, make America great again. So... Uh, so often when we have these conversations about immigrants, about refugees, about Islam, about America's role in the world and these things, it's often there's no conversation about the context of where these issues are coming from. And until we can understand those contexts, 
you can't reach across the aisle because it's logical for you to think the person across the aisle from you is actually crazy. And there are actually like cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, right? Uh, but in reality, they're responding to a world in which they've seen their small town destroyed by, uh, well, you know, globalization is a big word, but like they've seen their economies wither away. They've seen their paychecks go down. They've seen after lifetime not being able to save any money at all. And they're having kids who are now going to college and spending $10,000 debt. So all of that adds stresses onto a society. And those stresses are being exploited. And that's part of our message that we try to say to people is that these stresses are being exploited by very specific groups in order for those groups of those individuals to benefit themselves at the expense of general population. So whenever I give a general talk about Islam 101 or what is Sharia or women's rights or whatever, I always give that context to realize that this has happened before. This has happened to many of the communities in America. It's sadly gonna to happen to other communities in the country. And this is a human problem that's now impacting our country today. And if we don't find a solution to it, you're gonna see the vision increase. You're gonna see the democratic institution in this country continue to deteriorate until America is no longer really a constitutional democracy. It's gonna be you know, something totally different. And for people who think, well, that's impossible and whatnot, other empires and other nations who are live long, longer than the U.S. have had the same fate, and that's really what the risk is today. And um, I think that's just something that needs to be kept in mind, that we need to come together or else the country is going to rip itself apart. And that's bad for everybody, obviously. Wise words. <laughs> um, I, I, time's probably running a little bit short here. Um, so I, w one more question. Where do we go from here? What are some practical things that we can do um, to reach across the, the aisle, bridge the divide, start conversations, start dialogues? What, what, would you have us, what would you have us do? A few things that I'll recommend is for, especially people running for office or activists out there, try to talk about the underlines of what you're standing for. So as a, as a group of people, we believe that all people should be treated fairly. You're not gonna find a lot of people who disagree with that. We believe that all people should have economic viability to live in the country prosperously, right? And to start with that, oftentimes we start a conversation with our moral uh, stances, which are the right way to do it, but we do it in those issues that are very divisive. So we do it like on abortion rights um, and other rights like that, right? Which are important, important issues to stand with. And at the same time, you can maybe disagree with somebody on abortion, per se, but you can agree with them when it comes to educating your children and funding for your school. You can agree with them on these other points. And I think as a country, once we start doing more and more of that, I think we'll be in a better place. On the civil rights perspective, which is a lot of what I do, we also have to realize that our civil rights are being taken away. Um, and the fear of Islamophobia and terrorism is a way for them to do that. So we have to realize that if we want to live in a country that respects our civil rights, then we need to understand that the Islamophobia and fear of um, the fear that it brings is use an excuse in order to arm police officers in order for like whenever you go to the uh, airport, you see those machines that do a full body scan. And every year it seems like the NSA is now spying on all of our, our all of our devices. So every year that's getting worse. So start from that area and also try to understand the, the pain that other people are coming from that drives them to somebody who's like a demagogue like Donald Trump, drives them into um, believing what they believe and then really finding ways to challenge them by going out, showing up and uh, participating in them. One example I can give you is that there's a Republican party here in St. Louis, like there is everywhere. And they have open meetings. So typically only Republicans go to those. But if you're a Democrat or you're liberal or you're progressive, whatever you want to call it, maybe it's a time that you start showing up to these meetings, hear what they have to say, and maybe challenge them, uh, but, you know, where they are, but do it in a respectful way, do it in a kind way. Because, again, until we physically reach across the aisle, social media is not going to help you reach across the aisle. Whenever you post on there, you're only in an echo chamber. The news that you watch also has its own slant, so it has to be a grassroots effort. Uh, that needs to be done. So I think these are just some basic advices I would give. And the last thing I'd give is showing up. So if you want to support LGBTQ rights, show up to their rallies, show up to the marches. If you want to show, uh, support immigrant rights or Muslim rights or whatever it is, whatever cause you have, it's good to be a social media activist, right? But at a certain point, you need to actually stand up, show up, get out, 
vote, participate, volunteer. Until you do that, our constitutional democracy does not work. The less that we as citizens engage, the more that those people who are invested in the system are financially profiting from the system, they're going to continue to sow these seeds of divisions because they're benefiting from that. They're benefiting from deregulation and so on and so forth. So um, I know our conversation probably got a larger term, but Islamophobia is a, a, a crosscut of, of all these different issues. And it all is related to Islamophobia because that's one of the many fears in this country that's used to push these push a large segment of the population to follow these different tracks. And I think until we can challenge that, we're not going to be successful. That's a lot to chew on. And uh, I think some really great advice. Um, it's not about um, being a social media typing warrior. We have to show up. We have to be visible. We have to be out in the communities because we are humans. We are all humans talking with each other at the other on the other side of this computer screen, on the other side of your phone when you're doing it. You're talking with the human. We are we are all humans. We have that in common. Hey, yeah. thank the you. The last thing I'll say real quickly yeah, is um, the very last thing I'll say is that I also go to gun shows because uh, I go to different gun shows and I also like sell you know like cell phone chargers or something silly. Yeah. But at these gun shows, when I'm there, I get to speak to very hard Trump supporters, very hard Second Amendment folks about difficult issues. And believe it or not, I can actually uh, there's this one guy who's selling these badges you put on your shirt that basically said gaffer, right? And, um, and had gaffer. In, in Arabic, it means somebody who doesn't believe in God, right? Okay. And he had these other incendiary things in Arabic. And then I went and spoke to him. I was like, you know, um, do you not believe in God? Are you not, you know, are you not Christian? Because I need a Christian, right? And I was like, yeah, of course I do. Well, so I was like, well, that symbol that you have basically means somebody who's a polytheist, somebody who, you know, builds idols and worships them. And I like, no, no, this means that I'm not Muslim. I'm like, no, no, that's not what it means. I'm Muslim, let me explain to you. And believe it or not, after that conversation, he took all those badges and he put them away. He's not one selling them anymore. So the point I'm trying to make is how many other people show up at a gun show who's a progressive, right? How many other people are going to show up? So when you show up, you'll be shocked at the changes that you can make in individuals' lives. And again, I think just showing up in those difficult settings is the way you make those changes happen. Let's do it. Wait, uh, November 6, 2018, Democracy Day. November 6. <laughs> Show up, don't forget. Yeah, thank you so much for your time, Jeremy. Hey, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to talk with me today and talk with us. Um, you're doing great work. Uh, the, the voice that you have is making a difference in this world, and uh, we need more people like you. Thanks for standing up. Thanks for doing your thing. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. You have a great day. All right, you too. Bye-bye.